Hello there, I'm Penny Melville Brown from Baking Blind. I've been cooking across six continents trying to show that disabled people can still do almost anything. And stop. Jennison, he works at LinkedIn in Silicon Valley in California, had flown over to the UK to cook with me for a few days in Hampshire. Right, you're done. <laughs> and I. This isn't really like one of my usual cooking videos, but more a podcast with pictures of us having discussions in the garden in Hampshire during a break from our cooking. We were discussing all the different ways that technology might be able to help me and him and other people with all sorts of different disabilities to actually operate more successfully in cooking, in work and in life in general. You're here in Hampshire to cook with me. I am. Uh, and you actually paid an outrageous <laughs> amount of money to do this through a charity auction. None of the money came to me, I had my dad. So what inspired you to want to come and cook? As, um, as in my own experience, uh, I was relatively kept away from the kitchen as a kid. Yes. Uh, more from a safety perspective, my mom was just nervous. Although she did bring me in to do manual labor and things. Yeah. Uh, but then obviously I did cooking because I had to eat uh, yeah. over time. But it's not something over the last number of years that I've made a priority or just done because life is fast, days are quick, <laughs> and I just get home and I don't, the, the idea, it's more of washing the dishes and the implements afterwards yeah. of cooking than anything else. But it just, if it's just for myself, I don't see a reason to, to make a huge production. Uh, and so this came up. I obviously heard about you uh, as, as a judge for your Holman Prize a couple of years ago. And I yeah. was fascinated, more just because I understood the concept of what you were doing uh, beyond the cooking. Yeah. Um, and I thought that that would be really interesting. And truth be told, part of it at the auction was I'm super competitive. <laughs> and when I noticed someone else was interested in the same thing, I had to up the ante. And luckily, I live and work in Silicon Valley and here I am because um, I can't think of anyone who actually cooks that I know who are friends really yeah it's it's again it's part of I guess a lifestyle you yes you leave the office you go maybe for a happy hour you grab a quick dinner or you'll have dinner at the office a lot of tech firms provide meals either free or at low cost so you either get lunch and dinner or breakfast and dinner. The company I work at has breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I only have lunch at the office. But yeah, so, the, the, so there's that already this, like your food's here, why cook? But you also say you get food delivered? I do, I use any number of, uh, whether it's uh, Uber Eats or Grubhub is another one, and they will get the stuff from they, restaurants. Are they I can see the sponsorship deal oh, oh, no, no, coming no, no, no. in now. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'll use whichever has an accessible app. How's yes, that? Yes, that's a really good answer. And which has good restaurant selection, because I'm yes. not looking to have McDonald's delivered to me. I want to have the food that There's I There's like. the McDonald's sponsorship, oh, gone. Oh, edit out. <laughs> um, but like good Middle Eastern food or, or good yep. Thai food, because I'm not going to make that stuff for me. I'm not going to make pad Thai with duck. Yes. Right? You saw how I handle chicken. <laughs> you don't want me to be handling duck meat. <laughs> so, and is this part of a trend in Silicon Valley? Is this how most people I, I exist? Think, I think it's a trend amongst, and sadly, I think it's a trend amongst many. I think we've worked ourselves into this thing where we're busy professionals. I don't know how people with families do it because yep. they get home and then they need to, you know, help people with homework, and it's just a lot easier. Um, but I remember my mom back in the day, you know, she'd come home from work and have to slave over a stove and cook food and stuff, but we've, we've gotten rid of that. It's, it's, we live in this uh, generation of convenience. Everything has an app. Everything yeah. is faster. People will cook on weekends yeah. uh, and things like so that. So it's, it's part of relaxation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and there are other sources of, of, of food yes. just to keep you going for the week yeah. while you're working. Yeah. And, and, and perhaps that's all part of just life being so much more yeah. pressurized now. now. I would say though, some of it is to the advantage of, of people who, who are blind. There are, there are organizations uh, that will remain nameless that deliver, <laughs> they will deliver- Don't promote those. <laughs> they will deliver recipes and ingredients that are measured out. Yes. So you actually have to do some level of cooking. Yes. Those I think 
would classify as having a little bit more. You have a little more skin in the game there. Was that Blue Apron? Yes. Yeah. Blue Apron is one of them. Yeah. That's uh, and, the, and there's some other companies that, um, whose names do actually do escape me, but they, they do yeah. provide you the ingredients and the recipes. Now, the recipes are in print, but with today's technology, you could either probably get them online or scan it, take yes. a picture of it, and off you go. As yeah. long as your kitchen is accessible, yep. and you and I talked a little bit about that, my, my stove top is actually flat. So is it the an burners, induction hob? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> hob is another word. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, um, the stove top. Yeah. So it's flat. Now, there are these little things. If you used your fingers, you could probably feel like the little round thing. But if the, if the stove top is that hot, are you going to be wanting to drag your fingers around? No, no. no. So the oven is the oven, but the stove top is not accessible. And the controls are buttons. Thankfully, there are buttons. Yeah. But there's a menu, so you have to kind of count yes. and, and hope that you've gotten to the right temperature. I've always said the thing that I really want is something that leaves liquid, liquid crystal display right. very quickly, right. very easy. Yeah. And, and you could probably do it through a phone. And I don't want to have to get a phone out in the middle of cooking right. and focus it up, find where the, de the yeah. little display is. I want something I just go slap onto the display and it will read it to See, me. See, you're old school, Penny, because people, most, a lot of people these days, they, regardless, they have their phone on their on their person all the time. I don't know about you, but I always, I'm, I feel naked without my phone either on me or close by. So the idea of using an app <laughs> is, is it, to me, it's almost like an extension of, of my, yeah. of my body, right? Because I just reach for my phone. I just phone. find it so much slower. No, I got you. Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking for immediacy, well. particularly if I'm, you know, cooking something and I can smell it's getting hot. Yeah. I need something where I can just turn it down immediately. Yeah. Well, and hey, anyone who's watching this startup, uh, you know, there's a mm. startup idea right there. Yeah, Contact absolutely. Penny. Do. <laughs> but talking about accessibility, yes. you are a co-founder of Global Accessibility Day. Tell me about that. Sure. So, uh, Global Accessibility Awareness Day is something that uh, my co-founder, Joe Devon, uh, so, hello Joe, if you're watching, um, he wrote a blog post in 2011, uh, we'll say in November of 2011, where it was a little bit of a rant, because that's what us tech people do, when we're not happy, we'll blog or find some other way to rant. Uh, but he, his, his dad, at the time, had, was, trying, was struggling using a bank website. Yep. Just to do simple things that you and I would take for granted, or anyone would yep. take for granted. And um, so we got on the, on the blog, ranted a little about that, and then mentioned, you know, most web, web developers, because he, he at the time was a web developer, he now is an owner of a, of a web agency. Yep. But at the time he was a developer, and he's saying, you know, developers, most developers don't even know that, have never heard a screen reader before, seen one, or know anything about what accessibility is. So he, he put a challenge forward and said, we need to have a day, a Global Accessibility Awareness Day, where people will um, take some time to learn about it. And just by happenstance, is when he published the blog, a tweet went, went out saying, you know, this blog post got published. I believe it was a Friday or Saturday night where I would typically be out and about. And just by happenstance, I saw a tweet is saying about this blog post, I activated the, the, the link, read the blog post in full, and responded to him immediately, telling him a little bit about myself. So he's in, he was and still is in Los Angeles at the time I was in Toronto. We didn't know each other at all. And I just said to him, hey, if you're really up for this, let's do it. Because I had already been involved in some other awareness work myself, um, uh, growing a couple of what are called accessibility camps. Yeah. And what those are uh, are free events, uh, typically on weekends, uh, that people are brought together and they learn about different aspects of design and development and accessibility. So I had already been doing that kind of stuff. Uh, people had, people had, I, I was inspired by others who had preceded me, but I had started some in Toronto and helped. So this is, this is all about awareness. changing the yes. attitudes, awareness, knowledge of people who are designing technology. Designing and, and engineering it, yes. Yeah. And, and the key with the events, whether it's Global Accessibility Awareness Day or the camps, is that they're not to be meant to be formal, stuffy, conference-y type yeah, things. Yeah, sure. It's informal. Typically, 
Uh, they're free events or low cost. They're held on Saturdays, the camps. Yeah. Anyway, so I and brought... And food is provided. Yes. <laughs> and I had that I didn't cook. Yeah. Um, but then, so with that experience and that passion that I had, you know, it was just pure, uh, what's the word? Serendipity? Yeah. That that's... Joe had the same idea. And both he and I are overly networked and overly tasked and busy. So we were the, the wrong people to pit, take something like this on, but we did. Yeah. And we got on the phone and we launched it in May, I think it was May 15th of 2012 was our first one. Um, and the history's all up. If people want to learn more about it, it's up at globalaccessibilityawarenessday.org. But essentially, we dot did, org. Dot org. Yeah. And essentially, we didn't think it was going to go anywhere, honestly. Um, so we ran it in the first year, and it just took off. And, and and I essentially and literally picked up the phone, and uh, and or sent an email to friends of mine in accessibility in different countries, explained to them what we were trying to do, and asked them if they'd be willing to help out and just run an event. Yeah. And that first year, you know, we started off with a bunch of different things. We, the, um, my, my colleague in India, a friend of mine there, she got the government of India involved. They had some big conference. That's amazing. That's amazing. In Australia, they had an event. Yes. And, they just, it just, and then here we are, what are we, uh, my math is awful. Seven years later, yeah. 2019, and we, this year we had over 100 events. Yeah. Uh, Apple has events at all their stores, or at many of their stores. And typically we find out almost like a couple of days before about certain of the events, but we invite people to contact us to let us know when they, where they're having events so that we can get the word out. And publicize and it. And publicize truth. it. Yes. So we have on our website uh, public events, uh, but we also publicize because uh, we wanted to give props to companies who are holding internal events or schools. Yes or other uh, nonprofits or charities who are holding events maybe for their own audience. Because the idea is we, that day, global accessibility is an, it's an excuse to just cause a conversation on any aspect of digital access or inclusion. And it could be anything from showing someone how to use a sip and puff device, yeah. uh, uh, or talking about how- Can you just explain? Sure. A sip, and a sip and puff device is something for people who don't have use of their hands or yeah. arms, so they use their, literally, they use their mouth, sipping and puffing to control, um, to control, rather than using a keyboard. Yeah, so to absolutely. control movement. Yeah. But it's things like that, or they could hold a conference or an event just talking about like how virtual reality could uh, be a game changer for people with disabilities. Or they could um, be presenting a new product, like this liquid crystal display. So what reader. motivates people, companies, but also the people in the companies, take part in this? What, what, what I think they just you? find it exciting and the, the fact that they're part of this global movement uh, uh, and, and it, I think that's a big part of it they and you know part of it is they want to be they want to be part of this thing they well, don't I, be, I'm thinking about tech people and yeah. most of them have got inquiring minds yeah. want to stretch the boundaries yeah. of what they're doing find new yeah. find new users yeah um, I just to be at the forefront of the cutting edge of where technology is going and actually if you get it right for people with you know, additional needs. Yeah. You are getting it right in the long term. Oh, it's that whole, yeah. It's that it? whole idea of inclusive yeah. design, right? Yeah. I mean, the some of the features on the iPhone and on the Android devices that yes. are assistive technologies for us, as you know, really started as something that was being a problem solved for people without disabilities. Yes. Like the voice recognition software that was never envisioned. I don't think in the beginning to be for people without use of their hands or arms. Yeah. Um, and I can imagine, I say this jokingly because I don't know, but I could just imagine that screen reading technology on the phones, you know, and you can turn your screen off. There must be um, spy agencies who must find that quite intriguing because you can <laughs> text and send messages with no one seeing what you're doing. Yeah, uh, and, and lots of adaptations that have been designed for mm -hmm. visually impaired people or other people with disabilities, yeah. suddenly they have this you know, value in the much bigger market. Absolutely. And um, some of these businesses are now starting to realize not just about, you know, um, social responsibility, mm -hmm. but also about profit, reaching new customers. Right. And, and then it's also sometimes tied to the to the vision and, and mission. Uh, in my, when I'm not here cooking with you, 
and I'm uh, paying the bills, I, um, I, I head up Accessibility Engineering Evangelism at LinkedIn. And so LinkedIn, among other companies in the Silicon Valley, have, have taken, made a decision to invest in accessibility. And part of the investment is actually having full-time people whose accountability is strictly on accessibility. Yeah. Now, it's going to take more than just a full-time person or persons to do that. You need, you need first of all, top of the house to be talking about accessibility so that it's... It's leadership, isn't it? It's leadership from the top. Absolutely. And it's also just, if they're saying it up, up there, then people have to be talking about it yeah. middle, mid, mid stairs and downstairs. Trickles all the way through, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. And it sets a whole ethos um, and a culture within a company. Oh, yeah. That actually, we want to reach every customer right. and not just be selective about our customers. Right. Um, and, and we're going to go for it. Yeah. I mean, for me, one of the things that, that, and I've been working in accessibility since 2006 full time, and one of the things that still gives me a charge uh, and, and keeps me working in the field that I'm in is when I hear from engineers and designers who've since left, whether it's my first job uh, at Royal Bank of Canada or where I am now at LinkedIn, they've moved on to other things, but they reach out because they, uh, they've gotten on to, and been infected with the passion and understanding of accessibility and they understand how to make things accessible and they want to do it at where they are now yeah and asking for advice and it's and all about spreading the word yeah particularly i mean i feel i feel honestly i feel so fortunate working in silicon valley because if you're going to make an impact or a change or if you're going to at least harangue people uh to make things accessible what better place to do it than a place like silicon valley yeah. And it's a it's a big responsibility. It is because you, you you know you are there in that leadership role. Yeah. In that valley, and um, and and I, if I you could need say, to yeah. change the world. Well, well, no pressure there. No pressure. <laughs> but I, um, I I would like to say that I as someone who is completely blind myself, um, do I feel an extra responsibility to make sure technology is inclusive of people who are blind? I feel a responsibility for it, but I would not be doing my job if I did not find... There's 1.3 billion people with disabilities out there, more than that. Yeah. People who are totally blind, completely blind, like you and I, make up one of the smaller subgroups of that 1.3 billion. So I would be doing a disservice if I advocated for and exclusively focused on making sure things worked for people who are blind. Now, Absolutely. now, that said, the, the argument is there that if you solve for the challenges and the, the technological challenges, mind you, of people who are blind, those are the most complex and it will end up helping everyone else. Yeah. But to say that I am walking around just thinking about blind people in, in the work that I do is, is incorrect. That's not what I do. I think about the full But you're full being range. inclusive yes. in your accessibility yeah. and you're looking at um, you know what is often the most challenging area, yeah. which is for blind people, but that will ripple down across the board. Yeah. And it's also it's, it's not actually the specific solutions that you're going to be inventing. Mm. Or, no, it, it is getting people to be more flexible yeah. and more imaginative and more innovative. And actually, in the world of tech, all of those things—imagination, innovation, cutting edge—are what it's all about. And that's where the next big um, leap forwards in the tech world are going to come from. You're trying to um, teach or, or, or encourage your fellow technology people. Right. Um, but but one of the first, yeah. Yeah, doesn't it the, start yeah. earlier? Well, one of the frustrations we have is that a lot of engineers and designers have never been exposed to accessibility or inclusive thinking yes. until they get to the companies. And so the big thing for me um, and, and for a lot of other people who work in accessibility is Engineering and computer science and design schools at, at the college and university level, yeah. Yeah, and at the boot camps as well, need to start teaching basic concepts of accessibility and inclusive thinking at that point. <laughs> they do. Can you imagine if you were in any other industry Oof. and you were doing training yeah. and your training excluded 20% yeah. of your potential customers? Yeah. You would say that that was negligent training. Absolutely. You? So we need, we need to really, main, and, and it also just, by doing that in the schools, 
we're more normalizing it because part of this is let's face it which is normal yeah Yeah. let's face it for you and i and i think you'll agree with me the i just talking about disability in general is not a comfortable subject for most people yeah and so by talking about it but by reframing it as by making things accessible you're empowering people with disabilities to actually have a life of their own by framing it that way as opposed to let's help the poor people with disabilities out there um, you know in the schools particularly we're gonna excite the students and and they're gonna want to do it because the engineers and designers that I meet nine times out of ten want to do the right thing there are usually circumstances beyond their control why that can not always be happening usually you know time Um, but yeah so we need to get the schools talking about even even like in in the elementary school they're teaching people but can can you imagine if 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 they were teaching and well we're not going to we're going to ignore women in our teaching yeah we're going to ignore black or ethnic minority people we're going to ignore some religious groups yeah you you they people would be horrified they'll be uproar yeah wouldn't they but oh we can ignore disabled people is that acceptable well the other the other piece of that and you just made me think about it when you talked about women is there's a whole movement uh diversity in tech uh yeah. the whole piece most of those conversations on diversity in tech do not include people with disabilities yes. they, they include the important groups uh, yeah, don't sure. get me wrong no, women no, no, no. lgbt all of those people vi- yes. uh, visible minorities yes but they it, there's never or typically never a conversation about people with disabilities actually working in tech because let me tell you as someone who's blind yeah. working in tech it's a lonely it's a little lonely because there aren't very many of us uh working in in, in tech roles in tech companies who happen to have a disability or impairment um or long, uh, you taught me a phrase out here that's long-term, long-term health condition. Yeah, who have a long-term health condition. So we need to, so two things. A, we need to educate engineers and designers of the future and the present on accessibility. But we also need to get more people with disabilities, impairments, or long-term health conditions into tech, yeah. because we know we have perspective that we would bring to a room. Uh, particularly if a product is just being spun up and just like, hey, let's build this. No one's going to think about, well, how would a person with a disability or impairment use that product? But by having people with disabilities in the room, that topic will be brought up early. And, and, and we'd be using it, we'd be testing it. You know, there's always this talk about we need to have people testing with disabilities. Sometimes it's hard for companies to find those people. Um, but if we staffed roles, not saying that they would be hired you know, to be a token tester. But if we had full-time roles for testers with disabilities in all the companies. But it it, it, it is, again, about just having a a broader concept of diversity. Yep, yep. And you inculcate that, you like that. I do. You inculcate that right from the beginning um, in in the training and in the leadership. And suddenly they're opening up and potentially widening their market by 20%. 20%. Absolutely. And that is a bite of a cherry that most people would be wanting if they're running a business. Yeah. And so it is complete madness just to ignore it. Yeah. And the big question to, for anyone who, who works in, in technology to ask themselves, who may be watching or, watching or listening to us now is, I mean, how do you, f- if you're not caring about accessibility or inclusive thinking or inclusive design, uh, are you comfortable knowing that you're putting out a product and you're excluding that 20%. I mean, are you able to go to bed comfortable knowing that you've done that? Because it's not that accessibility or or inclusive thinking is something brand new. This has been around for a long time, starting with physical architecture. So for people to say, oh, well, I didn't think about it because I didn't know about it. I mean, to me, that argument is getting less and less acceptable. I, I mean, I said in the beginning that there's a lot of people who still don't know about it. That's fair. But people can't use that as an excuse forever. No, uh, we, we, we have things, dare I say it, called legislation mm-hmm. and law. And for an individual or a company to say, oh, no, I'm not going to bother with that bit of the law, yeah. it's clearly optional. Yeah. Um, what do their lawyers advise yeah. them about? It's extraordinary behavior, isn't it? Well, yeah, and for me, like an accessibility issue is really a technical bug. And so yeah. would you like if would you allow something to go out with security um, yeah. violations? Yeah, security bugs or privacy bugs. 
So why, why would it be different for people with disabilities? Okay, so tech companies need to do better. Mm -hmm. There are ways for them to do better yeah. and there's a whole market for them to exploit if they can achieve that. Yep. And none of it is actually that difficult, is it? No. You're speaking as a tech person. Yeah. It's no, it's not that difficult. It's not that difficult at all. Yeah. Now, peeling eggs. Now, I was going to say, what was your, <laughs> what was your memorable um, event from cooking here with me? Uh, I think the most memorable and impactful thing that happened was squeezing the sausage out of the casing. And, yeah, and just seeing what's, and feeling what is actually in there. We were making um, scotch eggs, so uh, we'd got um, softly boiled eggs. Yes that you yeah. had to peel. I um, did, and, and I didn't know my own strength. And uh, sadly, <laughs> one of the eggs just got... <laughs> yes. And then we were using some sausages made by, by the local butcher. And um, we were squeezing <laughs> the sausage meat out of their skin. Yeah. And that was um, interesting. Yes. Uh, I, and then you had to mold it round the egg. Yes, which was something else. <laughs> but I will say one of the more interesting things uh, that you showed me was the sous vide. Um, yes and that whole thing and and i chuckle when you told me that the vacuum sealer that we get for the bags that we have yes. to seal that that's people say people who are blind shouldn't be allowed to use allowed these. to use these I, I i got another machine the other day and the instructions say this machine is not for people with visual or hearing impairments well, and you're thinking the cheek of it right the absolute cheek so you know we do we mentioned the accessibility yeah. but these are companies who have deliberately excluded people right from the start, yeah. from the get-go, the design. Yeah, um, but, but yeah, so the sous vide was really interesting. I could see myself, I could never see myself squeezing out sausage again or peeling an the egg. The scotch eggs were good though. They were delicious. They were. I'll let someone else cook them. <laughs> but um, I could certainly see myself using a sous vide. Um, yes, that's uh, the water bath. That's the water bath, yeah. Yes, and, and where we vacuum packed the food. Yeah. yeah, but part of it for me and coming out here was just getting an opportunity to do something that I, I wouldn't ordinarily invest time in doing just because who wants to do all those dishes? <laughs> but, um, but being able to try things and, and there was one thing I'd never done before, I'd never chopped an onion. Yes, I know, call the press. <laughs> but uh, because, and I also heard that you cry after you chop an onion. I think you cry if you cut your finger. You do, <laughs> you can sob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, um, but just doing stuff like that because it's out of my comfort zone, uh, you know, ad admittedly. It's not something, I don't walk around with dreams of pairing uh, vegetables and fruit or even cooking. And but, zesty. And ze oh, we you forgot about the zesty. 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 Yes. And, and, and the, one of the gentle coaching that you gave me was, what was it? Cooking takes a little bit of force because I was with my tech hands, which are used to like touch delicate, the keyboard. Delicate, delicate yes. They are. De you feel the strength of yeah, my I know. Hand. Yeah, but you have military hands. <laughs> <laughs> but whether it was cracking uh, walnuts or uh, chopping uh, oat or quartering dates. Yes, you hated that, didn't you? Well, it wasn't hating it, but, but I know because Penny would come over and go, so how, how far are you along with that? And I was honest with her and I could totally tell her reaction. <laughs> it was like, really? You're yeah. only there? Yeah, <laughs> we've had some fun though. We have absolutely had fun, and I would love to come back out and visit. And You've been and extraordinary welcome. Do that again. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for everything you've done over the last few days too. It's Please do have a look at my Baking Blind YouTube channel for more of Jennison. Um, he was on a really steep learning curve when it came to cooking, but he did succeed in making some excellent dishes. And I introduced him to a traditional English trug. We've been collecting these apples. You've been drinking the juice from yes. our apples. And, and we've got here in front of us a trug. Let me show you a trug. This is um, an old English sort of basket for collecting fruit or gardening. And it's made out of willow with a handle here in the middle. So you can wander around your garden like a sort of pastoral idyll, <laughs> collecting your fruit in a trug. In, in a trug. <laughs> now, but, it, what makes it a trug as opposed to a basket? Because these phrases that you've been teaching me here in <laughs> England, 
Like shrug versus basket. Well, it's one. It's the shape. Okay. Because can you feel it? It's it's quite long. Yeah. And then it has quite a low handle. Okay. The other thing is, it's made out of wood, so it's made out of willow, and actually sheets of wood just rather than there. sort of branches that are woven together. I think it's just a but basket. Like a simple it is a <laughs> can I tell you, it's a very <laughs> fancy basket, and this is handmade. Oh well, then hand crafted. Then it makes it a trug. It does. It does. <laughs> and but it, they're, they're, they're nice pieces of kit, and we've been collecting all these apples. They're just pouring off the trees mm. at the moment.